Hey guys, thanks for tuning into the message. It's going to be 30 minutes long, preached by Pastor David, and it's going to be really awesome. So, enough of me. Roll that video. How you guys doing? Yes, I am preaching tonight. If you guys don't know me, yeah, uh, my name's Allison. I'm super excited. All right, all right. Uh, someone's really excited over there. Um, I'm super excited to be preaching tonight. Literally, it is such an honor for me every time I get the opportunity to do it. And I'm preaching this week, but y'all better buckle your seats because my dad's going to be here next week, Pastor Ray. And come on, it's going to be a Goolsby one-two punch. Come on, he's going to come and bring the word. And listen, if you like me, you're going to really like my dad because he's way cooler than me. Um, and if you don't like me, you'll still like my dad because he's way cooler than me. He's awesome. You're going to love him. So um, make sure that you're here next week because it's going to be ridiculous. And um, I get the honor of preaching tonight because our very own Pastor David this morning preached on Sunday morning um, here at all, all of the, the uh, at, at the Merritt Island campus, and it goes out to all of our other campuses. And he absolutely crushed it. So it's a pretty big deal. I mean, there's thousands of people that heard Pastor David preach. And so as the mezzanine, we want to support him. If you want to go watch that online, you can watch it. Support Pastor David. He was ridiculously awesome. Just wanted to shout it out to you. But I get the honor of, of preaching tonight, not only because of that, but because tomorrow we leave for youth camp. There's, yeah, there's, there's uh, several of us in the mezzanine who are youth leaders here at East Coast Christian Center, and we're about to leave for a week with middle schoolers and high schoolers. So I implore you to pray for us because we need all the prayers we can get. Um, it's an incredible week where we press in with, uh, with the kids and it is absolutely incredible. So seriously, if you guys can pray over us, that would be awesome. But I have a whole bunch to say tonight. I have a whole lot burning on my heart and so I wanna jump right into it. But before we do that, I think we need to pray because I need Jesus. So Lord, <laughs> thank you for being here. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you in this place right now. And we say, just soften our hearts and open our ears to hear you clearly, Lord. Speak through me in this moment. God, I, I just ask right now that anything going on in, in our lives, anything that's happening, Father, I ask that you would just overwhelm us with your love. Speak to our hearts tonight, God. We are tuning our attention to you we are so excited about what you're going to be doing in us. So we thank you for your presence here. Thank you that we get to worship you tonight. Thank you that this isn't just another mezzanine, God, that you are going to uniquely move tonight. That chains will be broken in Jesus' name. Hearts will be healed in Jesus' name. I just release that into the atmosphere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to jump right in. How many of you guys know about a month, month and a half ago, I went to Africa? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I took Africa by storm. It was incredible. It was literally probably one of the single most life-changing things that I have ever done. I saw incredible miracles. And just, you know, I'll probably, I'm going to be talking a little bit about it tonight. So stick with me as I walk through these Africa stories. But I saw some of the most incredible things in my life. I got to be a part of feeding like 6,000 children in one day. I saw three deaf people receive their hearing. I saw incredible things. So you can imagine when I came back, I was pumped up to tell everybody about what happened to me. It was crazy. But you want to know the one thing, as I started to talk to people, the one thing that they asked me, they didn't really ask me as much, you know, what happened, tell me about, you know, the crazy things you saw. I really got one question the most, and this was it. Allison, how did you handle the food? How did you handle the food? That was the number one question that I got. If you don't know at all, I am one of the most picky eaters. 
on the face of the planet. I don't like vegetables. I don't want nothing to do with them. I ain't got time for all that, right? I don't like, I'm super, super picky. So the, the one thing I hear, I heard the most was, how did you handle the food when you went to Africa? Now, we mostly had rice and beans, which I could handle. I had it twice a day for two weeks. Hey, oh, what up, carbs? But I love rice, so I was into it. But there's a couple times that we had some crazy, crazy things. Now, one of the things that we had, this was one of the hardest, this was truly a struggle, because I don't want to go to Africa and be that American. You know what I mean? That's like, ew, I don't, I'm not going to eat that. And there's starving people around you, so I'm like, suck it up, Goolsby. Get it together. <laughs> this is the moment where you need to suck it up. So we go out into the bush, which means that we were going far out into these, like, remote villages, right? And we had this outreach that we did. There was like over a thousand people that came and it was absolutely incredible. But we get back to where like our tent area was and I'm like, I am so hungry. What is for dinner? And they said, man, it's going to be really good. We are having tuna spaghetti. And the topping, like the sauce, was mayonnaise. Y'all, let me just tell you, I hate tuna. I equally hate, if not greater, I hate mayonnaise. It's disgusting. But African mayonnaise, I don't know what was happening, but you know, like here it's like jiggly and kind of like sticks together. This was like liquidy mayonnaise. Ugh. It's making me want to gag thinking about it. So they hand me this plate full of tuna, spaghetti, mayonnaise mush. And I was sitting there trying not to heave. So I went behind, um, I went behind a tree. And it was super dark. So I'm literally, you eat with your hands. I'm shaking, trying to put it in my mouth, going, ugh. Ugh, trying to hide from everybody. And I look over, and this, there's a little village kid looking at me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> just like this. And then all I did, it was quiet. We didn't exchange any words. He spoke another language, so we, it wouldn't have worked. So all I did was look at it and hand it to him. And he scarfed it up. And I was like, praise God, I don't have to finish it. Literally, I didn't offend anybody. I fed a hungry kid. I'd say, it's been a good night, right? And I didn't eat anything that night. I went hungry. And it was funny because the next time we went out in the bush, we went twice. I brought granola bars to preemptively stay away from the tuna mayonnaise mush. But it's kind of funny. And, you know, we can laugh about how I didn't want to eat and I went hungry, uh, you know, one of the nights. But it's a whole other ball game where you start to realize how many of those kids, how many of those people actually do go hungry. Every single day, every single night. They don't just go hungry, but a lot of times they go thirsty. Everywhere we went, we all had, our team had bottles of water. Everywhere we went, the kids always asked us for our water. They'd say, baby agua. And I'd pour it into their mouths. But I'm telling you, it wrecks you on the inside when you look into the eyes of a child who doesn't know when they're going to get their next meal. It wrecks you. But let me tell you something, Mezzanine. What wrecked me even more than, than seeing this intense poverty, to see people who are hungry and thirsty and don't have the luxuries like we do, what wrecked me even more was to see their spiritual hunger and thirst for the presence of God. Come on. I have never in my life seeing that kind of hunger and thirst for the presence of God like I did in Africa. Because of these people, it was like they had nothing else. The only answer that they had was to cling on to Jesus, right? And so God began to open my eyes. God began to open my eyes and show me things about what it means to be hungry, what it means to be thirsty for his presence. And so that's what we're going to be digging into tonight. We're going to dive right in. We're actually going to start. I, I'm thirsty now, so I need water. We're going to kind of hover on this story in John chapter 4. And it's an incredible story about Jesus. Let's start 
John chapter 4, verse 5. It says, eventually he, being Jesus, came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Listen to Jesus' reply. He says, if only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Come on. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. She said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Come on. This is part of the story. We're going to dive into the rest of it in a minute. But things just got so real right now. Things just escalated super quickly, right? It's hot. It's noontime. Jesus comes to this well, and a Samaritan woman came. Now, that's pretty significant that she was coming in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, because that's not normally when the women would come to get water right? You wouldn't come in the heat of the day. You'd come either at an earlier time or a later time. So it begs the question, why was she coming when no one else would be there? Most likely be because she was trying to avoid the crowds. Probably because she didn't want to hear the gossip. Probably because she didn't want to be the center of attention and have other people talking to her. And Jesus just happened to be at this well. And I love Jesus asked for water, and she immediately asked, why are you asking me for water? I'm a Samaritan, and you're a Jew, and they have nothing to do with each other, right? Not only is that, not only is she a, a Samaritan, but she's a Samaritan woman with a past. She's obviously ashamed because she's coming, at the well, coming to, the, to the well at a time that no one else would come. And I love Jesus' response. Guys, grab a hold of this. It says, if you only knew the gift God had for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Here's what I love about this. Jesus doesn't care where she came from. Jesus doesn't care what race she is, what people group she's a part of, what her past looks like. He says, listen, you need to know the gift that God has for you. And if you ask me, I will give you living water. See, here's the thing. Jesus is the living water, amen? He's saying no matter where you come from, no matter where you've been, no matter what's happened in your past, come to me. I'm going to give you living water. And see, it's not an accident that Jesus relates himself to living water. It's not an accident. How many of you guys know that about 60% of your body is made up of water, right? You guys know that you can only go about three days without water before your body will begin to shut down and you will eventually die, right? Your physical body needs water to be able to survive, needs water to be able to function. 
It helps your brain, your muscles, your bones, your organs, your heart. It, it's the thing that sustains you. So it's no mistake that God, that Jesus is saying in this moment, I am the living water. I am the very thing that sustains you. Come on. He's saying, I'm the one that brings you life. Because it's in his presence that you find everything that you need. Come on. He says in, that, in the scripture, it says it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. It's in his presence we find everything that we need. And the beautiful thing about it is that we have full access to the gift that is his presence. Mezzanine, that's good news. Jesus is saying, I am everything you need to walk through life. And all you have to do is come to me. Come to me, Mezzanine. He says, come to me. I'm going to create in you living water. Thirst only for me. See, it's in his presence that he breaks down walls of shame. He shuts the door on our past. He gives us vision for the future. He gives us peace in the storm. He gives us provision in the lack. Comfort when we hurt. Healing for our hearts and bodies. Joy for mourning. Breakthrough instead of bondage. Come on, don't make me preach. Courage when we're scared. Strength when we feel weak. Power. See, it's all found in his presence. And he says, come to me. I am the living water. He's looking at this woman who is bound by shame and condemnation. And he says, come to me. I am the living water. I am everything that you need. See, when I was in Africa, um, I got the privilege of going to some of their church services at the base that we were staying at. I actually have a picture. You can throw it up there. So this is holy chaos going on right here. I'd like you to, that's the stage right over there. That's some line dancing going on during worship. That's some serious dancing, okay? That's my kind of church. I was digging it, okay? I was loving it, right? Over here, those are some of my teammates. It's kind of a poor picture because I was jumping up and down, having myself a time. Um, but over there, um, you can see all those people. There's village people. They bus villagers in from all these other villages because otherwise they wouldn't have any way to get to church. And if I had one word to describe their church service, it would be holy chaos, it was beautiful, it was wonderful, but it was chaotic. There's kids running everywhere, people dancing, people shouting. So you can imagine, I was loving it, but it's in another language. I have no idea what's going on, but I'm into it. I'm going with it. But it was a little bit hard to, to tune into the spirit because there's just so much going on in that moment. So next thing you know, we started doing some worship songs. And they actually did one um, in English. And um, some of you might know this song. Um, it's called All I Need Is You. And I was like, yes, English. <laughs> I know this. I'm so excited. And it goes, all I need is you, Lord. It's you, Lord. All I need is you. So I'm worshiping. And I look around and I see like right in the middle, there's a bunch of um, men and they're kind of standing there, kind of just looking at what, what was going on and Right in the middle of all these men who didn't really look like they were engaging in worship, there's this 10-year-old little boy. And he is weeping with his hands up in the air, singing out, all I need is you, Lord. It's a very simple, it was this very simple moment. I just happened to see this little boy. But it absolutely wrecked me. And like that, I fell to my knees, I began to weep, I lifted up my arms, and I said, Lord, I need what that little boy has. He has such a thirst for your presence. And guess what? When he says, all I need is you, Lord, I actually believe him. It was like this moment where I realized and, it, and, and let me clarify this. It wasn't even, a, it wasn't a condemning thing. Like, you're not thirsting for God, right? It wasn't that. It was like the Holy Spirit was just gently showing me some areas that I had been looking to 
to satisfy and to fulfill me. And it was, those were things that would never do that, right? Because he's the only one that can do that. So things like career, success, relationships, you can go right down the line and the Holy Spirit begin to show me, here are some areas where you have been thirsting after things that won't fulfill you, that won't satisfy you. It was like I had to get brought back to, I mean, I'm on a concrete floor in Africa, and it kind of took that for me to realize and get back to the place in my heart where I said, only you satisfy me. It was like God had to show me again who he really was, not who I made him out to be. Come on. It was a moment where God said he's going to show me who he really is, not who I made him out to be. And I think one of the main reasons that sometimes we lose our thirst for him is because we think that when we come into his presence, we know what we're going to find. It's predictable, right? We've been to mezzanine. We've come a hundred times. And if this is your first time, stick with me. You, you've come a you've come hundred times, right? You've done this. And you think that you know what you're going to find when you come into his presence. But here's the thing. When you are in relationship with Jesus, you're going to have to come to the realization that there are things about him that you don't know. That you don't know and that you need. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus says, I want you to discover them. That's why there has to be a thirst on the inside of you that says, I know there's more. I've experienced so much of you, God. I've experienced incredible love, but there's more. It goes deeper. And I love there's this song by Jen Johnson. She's a worship leader out at Bethel in California. She has this song, it's called In Over, My, In Over My Head. And as soon as I started thinking about all this stuff, this, this song popped in my head. I want you to hear some of the lyrics. It says this, I've come to this place in my life where I'm full, but I'm not satisfied. This longing to have more of you. And I can feel it, my heart is convinced I'm thirsty, my soul can't be quenched. You already know this, but still, come and do whatever you want to do. Here's the chorus. It says, would you come and tear down the boxes that I have tried to put you in? Let love come teach me who you are again. Would you take me back to the place where my heart was only about you and all I wanted was just to be with you? Come and do whatever you want to. And if there's one thing mezzanine tonight, I just said, Lord, if there's one thing that I communicate tonight, it's this, that I want to thirst for you, God. I want you to come, God, in this place tonight and tear down every box that I have tried to put you in. And I want you to show me again who you really are. To remember my first love. He is that love, that relationship. Come teach me who you are again. Thirst for him, Mezzanine. But I love that the story that we are reading about the Samaritan woman. I love that that wasn't the end of the story, right? Jesus calling out that you had five husbands and you're living with one now and you're not married to him. And she's like, whoa, you must be a prophet. That's not the end of the story. So we're going to read. We're going to pick back up in John 4, 25 through 36. It says, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then the disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Why are you talking to her? The woman left her jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? 
So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Listen, this is the best part. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Salty. I read it like that. That's how I hear Jesus. I got a kind of food you ain't know nothing about. Right? Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained. Listen to this, guys. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me, from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought into eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. Guys, this is incredible. This woman is so astounded that Jesus knows about her life. She realizes he's the Messiah. She immediately, after encountering Jesus, immediately it says she left her jar by the well, left, ran, and told everybody about this guy. You have got to come see him, she told everybody. Now, wait a second. This was maybe like a 10, 15 minute conversation between this woman and Jesus. Wasn't this the woman who was coming in the middle of the day, who was ashamed to be seen with those people? And now she's running straight into them, calling the attention to herself, saying, you got to come know this Jesus. Because here's the truth. When you encounter Jesus, shame gets crushed condemnation from what you did in your past gets crushed. She said in, in a 15, 10, I don't know how long it is. I'm guessing 10 to 15 minute conversation with Jesus. The things that held her back from her past were done. She turned around and went straight to the people that she was afraid were going to judge her and told them about Jesus. Come on. And this is just a little side note. This just popped up in my heart. Sometimes when we get saved, we get in this place that, man, I got I to gotta study the word. I got to be in this place. I got to know more things before I go and try and tell people about Jesus. Girlfriend had a, a, a five-minute conversation, and she went and told her entire village. I think tonight's the night that that excuse dies. Your moment with Jesus is enough to change people's lives. Why? Because it's real and because it's yours. That's just a little side note. Take that. That was for somebody. So she has this moment with Jesus. And the disciples come and they say, Rabbi, you need to eat something. And he says, I've got a kind of food you know nothing about. I started thinking about. You know, he's talking to his disciples. His disciples are the ones that walk with him. The disciples are the ones who have been with him through his ministry. The disciples are the ones who have spent the most time with Jesus. I feel like of all the people that should know what he's talking about, it should be them, right? It should be them. Why did he say that to them? But I think there's a really important part in the scripture that we shouldn't miss. Go back to verse 27. This is right when the disciples were walking in on Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. It says, just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Why are you talking to her? You see, it was scandalous. Jesus talking to this woman was absolutely scandalous because culturally, a man could not talk to a woman alone without her husband being present, right? Not only was he talking to a woman alone, she was a Samaritan woman. A Samaritan woman, Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. But on top of that, she was a Samaritan woman with an ugly past. The disciples said they were too afraid to say, what are you doing with her? They were shocked. Here's the thing. The disciples were completely missing what Jesus was doing in that moment. Because 
here's the thing. Once you've encountered the presence of God and you have learned what it means to become thirsty for him, once you, once you have tasted the living water, you know what it means now to say, I need your presence more than anything. God says, now that you know what it means to be thirsty, I want you to be hungry. Now that you know what it means to be thirsty, I want you to be hungry, right? You've encountered his radical love. Now he says, I want you to become hungry for the overlooked. I want you to become hungry for the rejected. I want you to become hungry for the unlovable. Why? Because he loves them. And the disciples were completely missing this. They would have walked right by that woman. They would have walked right by her. And I love that Jesus said, he said, I get my nourishment from doing the will of the Father. Here's what he says. Wake up and look around. The field is, what is ripe for harvest. This is at the moment that all those Samaritan people were coming up to come see Jesus. He said, he looked at those disciples and said, wake up. They are your harvest. A rejected, overlooked people group. Jesus said, they are your harvest. Become hungry. And here's the thing. I really believe tonight, can you guys tell I'm fired up about this? I believe tonight that God is stirring up on the inside of us a, a hunger and a thirst, not just to talk about changing the world, but then to actually do it. Come on. Here's what I felt like the Lord told me tonight. Now, this might blow your minds. I felt like there, the Lord told me tonight that there are people in here that he wants to give nations to. Come on. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry to see the world know Jesus. I don't want to sit by and do nothing. I felt like the Lord said, there are people in here that I will give nations to, but the hungry ones are the ones who will actually get the nations, the ones brave enough to actually do something about about, about sharing the word of God. He says, it's the hungry ones who said, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to pursue those people. But listen, if that's you I'm talking to, and as I'm, as I'm talking about reaching the nations and, and, and sharing the love of God, and that's beginning to stir up on the inside of you, listen, you will not start with a nation. You will start with a woman at the well. Come on, guys, don't miss this. You will not start by saving a nation. You will start with a woman at the well. You start by giving radical love that you have received to every person that you come in contact with. Because a moment with Jesus, with a woman at the well, led to that entire village coming up to see him. Who is your woman at the well? What if your woman at the well is your coworker? What if your woman at the well is your ridiculously hard to deal with family member? Come on. What if your woman at the well is the homeless person sitting outside of Walmart? What if your woman at the well is that person at the food court? It will never be convenient. And here's the truth. Hunger crushes comfort. Y'all didn't hear me. I said, hunger crushes comfort. I don't know in, in real life if I've ever been hungry and I've been like, man, this feels great. <laughs> I love being hungry. 
No, it's uncomfortable. I want Chick-fil-A. Come on. <laughs> Chick-fil-A is the answer to everything. Just like it's uncomfortable in the natural, it's also uncomfortable in, in, in the spirit realm, in the supernatural. It's uncomfortable for a reason. Because when you're comfortable, oftentimes you're not stepping out. When you're uncomfortable, there's growth, there's breakthrough. Listen, God is saying, become hungry tonight. Become hungry tonight. It's going to be uncomfortable. But I don't want to, and, and this is just me, I don't want to be the kind of person that just hears about what God is doing in the world. I don't want to be that person that's like, man, that was so cool what happened over there. Guys, I want to be on the front lines. And I'm looking at you guys, and I know you guys are called to be on the front lines too. Crushing the kingdom of darkness. Listen, we've got a world, a nation, a community that is hurting right now. There's a ton of pain happening. There's a ton of division, a lot of racial division. There's a lot of stuff that's happening. Who is the answer? It is only ever Jesus. And I don't want to sit back and watch. I want to stand up and be a part. That's what God is calling to us to tonight, guys. Here's the thing also. Hunger leaves no room for complacency. Hunger leaves no room for complacency. It's more than just an hour and a half on Sunday night. It's every day looking people in the face, saying, you know what? I love you because God loves you. Can I have the band to come, up, come back up? I believe tonight, and here's what I felt like the Lord was telling me. I believe tonight that he is releasing over us a thirst for his presence and a hunger for his people. Come on, I'll say it again. I believe God is releasing over us a thirst for his presence and a hunger for his people. But before we can reach the nations, before we can touch the community, it starts in here with us, you guys. It starts with having an encounter with him. And maybe you've been to mezzanine a hundred thousand times, right? Listen, God tonight wants to release a fresh revelation of who he is. Let him break down the boxes that you've tried to put him in. Let him teach you who he is. Let him love you. Take the things that are on your heart. Take the things that are overwhelming you right now. It might be your finances. It might be your relationships. It might be your career. It might be the direction you're going in life. Whatever the thing is that is overwhelming you right now, take it and put it at his feet because he is the living water. He is the living water that's on the inside of you. And so we're going to be singing a song in just a minute once the band gets ready. You can come on up. And it's called Come to the River. We've sang this song before at Mezzanine, but it's been a while. And so I want us to spend just a little while in worship. And here's what I felt like the Lord wanted to do. The song literally says, come to the river, all who are weary. I felt like the Lord was saying, come to me tonight. Give me the things that are weighing on your heart. And listen, guys, I'm not up here because I have it all together. This is something that I am living right now. Because just because I have a microphone doesn't mean that everything in my life that I've just got it together picture perfectly. This is something that I'm walking out, that I'm learning how to do. I am actively having to say, God, what's going on in my heart I give to you. 
And I felt like the, the Lord just wanted to pour out the sweetest love on us tonight. His presence is here right now. The Holy Spirit is here right now. And he says, this is the night for breakthrough. Come on, this is the night, the breakthrough you've been crying out for. This is the night for breakthrough. So I want us to stand up right now. If you don't know the words of the song, if you don't, if you don't know this song, you don't have to try and sing every word. I would encourage you, look in your heart right now and say, what is it right now that I have thirsted for above Jesus? I wanna lay it at your feet. Take everything that's weighing on your heart right now and lay it. Hey guys, that was a great message, that was awesome. If you guys need prayer or you guys want to let us know anything that God moved on your heart, just hit the prayer icon and let us know. I'll see you next week.